Welcome everybody to today's Building My Legacy podcast. We have with us today, Paul Shapiro. Paul Shapiro is fascinating because he is, has a whole new approach to food. And we talk about sustainability in many, many different places. We're sold on it until it intrudes on things that are very dear to us, like what we eat. And so <clears throat> Paul Shapiro has a company that deals with what is there an alternative to meat as we traditionally know it? And we'll have him talk a little bit, bit about that. He has a business called Clean Meat. He has written about it. He has had TED Talks talking about uh, clean meat. He has become quite a, an important influencer in the world of agriculture and food and what we're going to do with our next generation, which is all about legacy, isn't it? So, Paul, with that, I would like you to share with the audience um, what got you started on this journey, first of all, and um, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Well, Lois, it's a real pleasure to be talking with you. Thanks so much. And the short answer to your question is the planet just isn't getting bigger. Uh, you know, humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself doesn't expand. We're not gonna be farming the moon. We're not gonna be farming Mars. We only have one body to farm. And so when you consider the fact that there are 8 billion of us walking around the planet today, and there's probably gonna be another 2 billion added to the planet by the year 2050, how are we gonna feed all these people? Right now, we have already deforested a huge amount of the planet. A lot of the reason we've done that is to produce meat. The number one cause of deforestation is raising animals for food, both to create pasture land and cropland to feed all those animals. And so if we don't want to cut down the rest of the Amazon rainforest, if we don't want to deforest the rest of the planet, but we want to keep on eating meat, then we're going to have to figure out ways to produce meat without animals. It's not dissimilar lowest to how we need to keep on producing energy, but without fossil fuels. So, you know, if you think about like you walk into a room, you flick on a light switch, you're not thinking about whether the light is coming from coal or oil or wind or solar, you just want light. Well, similarly, when most people eat meat, they're not thinking, ah, I'm so glad an animal was slaughtered for this. If anything, they might actually prefer that an animal not be slaughtered for it. And so the question is, if we can make light without fossil fuels? Can we make meat without animals? And that's what my book, Clean Meat, is uh, about. And that's what my company, The Better Meat Co., is also trying to do. So tell me, you talk about creating real meat from animal cells. What is that? How do you do that? <laughs> sure. Well, just in the same way, there's lots of ways to make energy without fossil fuels. So you have wind, you got solar, you got geothermal, you have nuclear and more. Well, there are lots of different ways to create a meat experience without animals. One, you can go to the plant kingdom and transform things like soybeans or peas or wheat and make it look like animal flesh. But you can also go to the animal kingdom and you can take actual animal cells and grow them in a cultivator to grow them and do actual real animal meat that is simply grown from cells rather than from slaughter. And so this isn't a meat alternative. It's not a meat substitute. It is real actual meat. It is actually pretty similar if you think about Lois, like, for thousands of years, the only way we had to get ice was out of nature. We had a big industry that harvested big blocks of ice out of frozen lakes and rivers and shipped it in insulated boats around the world. Well, then you had the advent of refrigeration. And all of a sudden, we had a human-made technology that could make ice. The only way to get it before was from nature, and now you have a technology. But in the end, it still is just frozen water. It still is the same product. It's just one is made by nature. The other is made by technology. Well, for thousands of years also, we've only been able to get meat out of animals' bodies. Now, a human-made technology is using the same building blocks of that meat, basically the muscle cells of these animals, to produce it in a way that is much more efficient, much more humane, and much more sustainable. And so in the same way that today, we're glad that we don't have to go out to frozen lakes in order to get ice and that we can make ice right in our own homes, I think in the future, people will be quite glad that we no longer have to torment and slaughter animals in order to produce meat. And that we'll think, ah, I'm so glad that there were innovators who have left an amazing legacy to us that we don't have to commit this type of violence against animals anymore. And instead we can just make meat right here from cells rather than having to raise whole animals. Okay, so I'm trying to understand in my mind, I, I'm trying to visualize your, your facility, your manufacturing. You have Petri dishes with cells 
I'm guessing, with medium that grows this. But what do they grow into? Do they grow into a mini cow, a mini pig? I mean, what what does the petri dish beget? <laughs> okay, well, first and foremost, we don't need a mini cow. We don't need a whole cow because when you're raising an animal for food, you know, your primary purpose is you want that muscle. You're, you know, yes, the eyeballs and horns and hooves might get used for something, um, but for the most part, you're really raising the animal for the muscle. So we don't need to grow the eyeballs and hooves and, and bones and so on. Um, so really, then you start thinking about these different ways that you can recreate the meat experience. So in the case that you're talking about with regard to animal cell culture, basically, it looks like a beer brewery. And so instead of brewing alcohol, though, you end up brewing meat. And in that particular case, you end up getting a group of cells that attach to what is called a scaffolding. And that creates the matrix by which you can create a chicken breast or a chicken nugget or a, you know, a fish stick or whatever the species of meat that you're growing is. You can also uh, do like, for example, what we're doing at the Better Meat Co, we use microbial fermentation and we subject microscopic fungi to a fermentation process which it's kind of like if you think about how a cow eats grass and converts that grass into a steak, but it takes a long time. It takes over a year of the cow eating grass before you get the steak. Mm. Well, with us, our little microscopic fungi eat corn or they eat potatoes and they transform it into something that looks like a steak, except instead of taking over a year to do it, they do it in less than one single day. So oh it's a... Yes, yeah, so it's very efficient. You can produce a lot of protein in a very small amount of time with very low footprint on the planet. And you don't have to harm animals in the process. Okay, so one steak in one day, and you put it, you create this on a scaffolding. What, what's your scaffolding made from? Well, in this particular case of the Better Miko, we're using microscopic fungi for that purpose. So okay. the microscopic fungi, which is sometimes known as mycelium, uh, is a, ha, has a naturally meat-like texture. So when you pull it out of the fermenter it, and, you, and you remove some of the moisture that's in it, it really looks like raw chicken almost. Um, and so this is a product though that on its own has more protein than eggs, more iron than beef, more potassium than bananas, more fiber than oats, and it naturally contains vitamin B12, which is typically lacking in the plant world. And so it's a real superfood. So How about cholesterol food, call, and some of the things that are negative about beef, for example? Zero saturated fat, zero cholesterol. It's a real superfood. Okay. So you, you do use vegetation, corn, soybeans, for that fermentation process or for that scaffolding that you, you are using. So you need some farming, some agriculture to get there. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you're not going to do away with agriculture. You'll just change. So in the same way, for example, um, if you imagine, um, let's well put it this way, we are creating a meat experience with far fewer resources than are needed right now to raise animals. But we still need resources, including you have to feed the cells or you have to feed these little microscopic fungi. And so you still are going to be needing some agriculture to feed that. But because you don't need as much, um, you're not growing the whole animal, you need far fewer resources to do it. So you can have more land that goes to things like reforestation and, and other uh, uses that are somehow uh, different from what they're used for now. Okay, so if I'm a vegan, is this enough vegan or am I just a miniature meat trying to pretend I'm vegan? That's so funny, okay. well. The plant-based meats today that are made from soybeans or, or from peas or from wheat, obviously those are fully vegan, right? There's no animal origin. Uh, with the microbial fermentation using microscopic fungi, there there's doesn't need to be any animal component to that either. But when you're talking about the cultivated meat where you're growing actual animal cells, it isn't a uh, non-animal product. It, it, it comes from animals. Now, you didn't have to harm or slaughter an animal to do it, but it does come from an animal. So I don't know that it really matters whether you consider it vegan or not. Like the point of it is not for vegans to eat it. The point of it is for people who eat meat to eat it. But um, I would go so far as to say, if you're concerned, if you're vegan because your concern is animal welfare, you have no concern about this. But if you have some other reason, like some personal purity really reason or a religious reason, and you don't want animal cells to be ingested into your body, that's a different matter altogether. 
Okay, so it, is your meat more expensive or less expensive than what is on the shelf today through the traditional farming method? Sure. So right now you have an animal agriculture industry that has scaled up tremendously. And so those prices are cheaper than what's typically called alternative meat today. And that is going to be the case for some time because the animal agriculture industry has been built over centuries, whereas this industry is very new. And so it is more expensive for the time being, but that doesn't mean that it always will be. And to use the animal cell culture example, Lois, so the very first time that a uh, cultivated burger was served from actual cow cells was in 2013. And that burger in 2013 cost over $300,000 to make. <laughs> Today, yeah, and, yeah, right, exactly. Not, not exactly uh, for the common people. Um, but today, less than a decade later, they're doing it for about 10 bucks. So you can see how there is a massive precipitous decline in cost in less than a decade. So then what will it be a decade from now? Probably pretty cheap, that's my guess. So if I have two hamburgers put in front of me, one your, your cloned or your meat that's made from animal cells, and then the traditional meat that's taken from a, a real cow, will I tell the difference in taste? It's a great question, Lois. So actually Time Magazine this week, we're recording this in late January, 2022. And Time Magazine just this week did a story on this very question. There was a blind taste test amongst renowned chefs in Israel, and they tasted an, a chicken breast from a slaughtered bird, and they tasted a cultivated chicken breast made by an Israeli startup that's called Supermeat. And these renowned chefs guessed incorrectly as to which one was the chicken from a slaughtered bird and which one was the chicken from cultivated chicken cells. So that means it's come pretty far if these chefs can't tell the difference. That's a pretty impressive feat that a company like Supermeat just pulled off. That's huge. So let me ask you another. I'm very pragmatic. So I, I, I'm trying to visualize how do people actually use this and do this in their everyday life. So I, I have guests coming and I want to grill steaks. Do I grill or can I not grill because there's aren't the normal fats? Uh, you can grill. And the question would be like, do you want something that is identical to a normal steak or do you want something that's even better? For you? So for example, if you want a steak that maybe instead of saturated fat has omega-3 fatty acids, so you'll have steaks that prevent heart attacks rather than causing them, uh, you know, you, you could theoretically do that, but it might change the sensory perception that you have of the steak if there are fewer saturated fats and more omega-3 fatty acids. So it'll be up to you. Uh, I think it'll be like a choose your own adventure. I believe that this new world of alternative protein production is actually going to open up novel culinary experiences. So let me put it to you like this. Imagine, Lois, the time... After humans had, in, had domesticated cows, so people were drinking milk, but before anybody figured out how to make cheese, so there was no curdling, right? So people right. were drinking cow's milk, but nobody knew anything about cheese. Nobody had fantasized about Gouda or Brie or Swiss or cheddar, or any of the other types of cheeses that people eat daily now. And that, when it was invented, when people realized how to curdle milk into cheese, that was a novel food. It was a totally new experience. All of these culinary pleasures that no one had ever fantasized about now became possible. And I think that's what's going to happen too. I think we're not just going to replicate the meat experience. We're actually going to become more interesting and more novel and cool new culinary experiences that will have people enjoying foods that they've never dreamt of in the past. So we've talked a lot about meat. How about fish? Because we're having the same problems in with fish, with there being where our oceans are getting outfished or we're destroying them with our pollution. So what about fish? There are many companies that are seeking to replicate the fish experience without the hook. And so there are companies, for example, like one in San Diego, it's called Blue Nalu. And they are growing real fish meat from fish cells. And I ate it and absolutely loved it. I thought it was great. And so they are only one of a number of companies, though, that are seeking to create a fish product without having to go plunder the oceans. That is quite amazing. So really, in a way, the part of your marketing has to be getting the, the people who are going to, who are going to um, cook the food, serve the food, to really start using it. And 
um, and developing a whole interest around that. So are you working with restaurants and some of the big name restaurants in order to achieve that? Well, at the Better Miko, we have everybody from food scientists and chefs and microbiologists and more who are all working to create the best animal-free meat experiences possible. We are currently partnered with companies like Hormel Foods and Purdue Farms to help them create great products for their customers. And in the future, we want to do even more. And so other companies, though, like if you look at KFC right now, they're serving a Beyond Chicken Nugget. So it's a plant-based chicken nugget that you can get at every KFC in the United States. And it's delicious. It's really wonderful. I had it. I loved it. Um, so these products are now coming onto the market. And they're coming onto the market, not just in the Whole Foods of the world, but also in the KFCs and the McDonald's. So if some of our listening audience wants to buy meatless meat, is that what you call it? Meatless meat? <laughs> it depends. Um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of debate about what is meat, you know, something meatless. So like, can you have, uh, for example, in the milk realm, people say, well, is almond milk milk or is it something else other than milk? Um, is coconut milk milk or is it something else? And people talk about the meat of the nut or the meat of the fruit. So, you know, there's, there's a bit of a debate as to what, you know, we ought to call these foods. However, the good news is that you can buy them nearly anywhere. Plant-based meat now has taken off. It's available in every major supermarket, most fast food chains and more. And so if you really, like, let's say you're going to Burger King and you could get a Whopper, you can get an Impossible Whopper now, which is a, a delicious animal-free burger that is really wonderful. And you can't tell the difference. You eat it, you think you're eating a regular Whopper. Uh, so there are uh, really no shortage of places where you can buy this type of what's called alternative meat right now. But in the future, I don't think it will even be called alternative meat. It will just be meat in the same way that it's just ice. We don't think about it as artificial ice anymore or synthetic ice. It's just ice. And that's what this will be in the future. Okay. So if, if I'm going to the grocery store today, not having heard about this before, what brands would I look for in order to find this? The most popular brands in the market today are going to be brands like Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, Light Life, and Morningstar, um, and, and Gardein. And so these are either in the refrigerated or the frozen section, and you can find them, and they are products that are really good. They sell them at Walmart, Kroger, and, and others. So you'll be able to find them pretty much wherever you go. Um, and try them out. Different brands have different benefits. And uh, my wife and I, we really like uh, eating uh, a lot of them, but we just last night were eating the light life chicken breast and it was phenomenal. It was really good. There's no chickens harmed and very light footprint on the planet, but it looked and tasted just like a chicken breast. We loved it. I think it's just amazing. Okay. This is, I think many people are going to be very interested in this because we have come to a point where people are concerned about our planet and our environment and what is it that we're leaving for the next generation? And so you talk about that a great deal. How are you, are you working with this to really make this part of that social footprint? And so also, you know, when companies have their parties, companies have their events, that this becomes also part of their thinking process. Yeah, I, I think that you're right, Lois. I think that people in the future are, or even people in the present are increasingly concerned about their footprint on the planet. We can no longer just ignore that what we are doing is having a very detrimental impact on the planet and therefore on hurricane risk, wildfire risk, tornado risks, rising sea, uh, sea, sea lines and more. So this is a matter where the climate changing world is already here. It's not in the future anymore, it's right here. And so the question is, what can we do? And, you know, sure, like some people may recommend, let's say, going back to walking and biking everywhere rather than driving and flying. And that's great. But I think a lot of people want to drive and fly. So we need to find ways to make cars that don't run on fossil fuels, as an example. Uh, I would be quite pleased if people wanted to eat Vietnam rice burritos and lentil soup and, and hummus. I, those are great foods. I love eating them myself. But a lot of people, I think, want to eat meat. And so the question is, can we satisfy humanity's meat tooth without the need to raise animals? And so if you're going to Walmart or Kroger or KFC, try these products out. 
enjoy them, get the plant-based meat, get those fermentation products and try them out and see if this is something that you would like to become a regular customer of because you will be doing your part to help create a more sustainable, better future for uh, not just our descendants, but for us today as well. So Paul, you talk about working with, you, you're, you work with the meat industry in with what you do. You work with um, retailers, clearly, with um, selling your product or getting them involved in purchasing. That's a collaborative effort. Is that, is that something that you have undertaken yourself or what, how have you gone about that? It is. Yeah. So at the Better Miko, we don't have, um, you know, marketing or sales staff. Uh, I, I do that myself. And we are partnered with companies, as I mentioned, like Cormel Foods and Purdue Farms, which are great partners. Um, so they recognize that the future of protein will be far more diverse than it is today. Protein might mean animal flesh to people today, but in the future, protein is going to be a far more diverse definition where people will be thinking about protein coming from plants, protein coming from microbes, protein coming from animal cells and more. And so in the same way that, for example, if you think about the film wars of the 1990s, where you had Kodak and you had Canon and they were vying for supremacy in the film market. Well, they both knew about digital. But Kodak was concerned that digital was going to cannibalize its core business of negatives and darkroom chemicals and so on. And so they didn't pursue it. Canon, though, said, even though this is going to cannibalize, we think it's the future. And so we're going to pursue it. And we all know what happened. Uh, Kodak went bankrupt and Canon is now the largest manufacturer of digital cameras on the planet. And there are many meat companies today that don't want to be a Kodak. They don't. They do want to be the Canon. They want to say, hey, we want to continue supplying our customers with the delicious protein that they love even if it's produced in a different way. Well, you know, Canon still sells us a way to capture our memories. We just do it now in a far more efficient way. We get our photos instantly rather than taking hours or days. And so while we all recognize that digital photography is vastly more convenient than print photography for us, um, we still are happy to buy digital cameras in, in, in the form of our phones. And so I think that's what's gonna happen. There are many forward thinking meat companies that'll be like Canon, and there are some backward thinking meat companies that'll be like Kodak, but enough of them are forward thinking that I think they're gonna be a part of this solution as well. So what's the process of converting mm -hmm. your farm, so to speak, from being full of cattle to being a animal cell producer of meat? Sure. Well, you probably wouldn't be producing the cells, but you could be producing the crops that are feeding the cells. And so uh -huh. that, that could be coming from things like corn or soy, honestly. Um, and so, you know, it, it's like I was reading an article not that long ago about how tobacco consumption has, of course, gone way down as people stop smoking. And so the tobacco growers uh, didn't need to grow so much tobacco anymore. It wasn't demand. But interestingly enough, at the same time, hummus consumption has gone way up in the United States yeah. uh, for whatever reasons. And so there's a much higher demand for chickpeas. And so now a lot of these tobacco growers are growing chickpeas. They never grown chickpeas before, but they learned how to do it. Well, that's going to happen in this other realm as well, that people who are raising cattle will now go to raising other uh, plant foods that can be used in the growing of these alternative meats. So how about developing countries? Are you working with developing countries because they always have problem with food production? Mm-hmm. Um, so at my own company, The Better Miko, that's not a big focus of ours today, but we want to do it in the future. Um, we want to make sure that we can create systems that allow for local production of food in that country. And that's one of the benefits. So if you take, you go back to your fish example, Lois, um, you know, if you're a landlocked country, you might not have local fish markets because you're not near the fish and they have to be transported inland to you. Well, what if you could set up a facility that was cultivating fish cells or even doing microbial fermentation and creating fish products without the fish? You could do it right there, right in that landlocked country and have a thriving fish market without the need to import fish from waterways that are hundreds or thousands of miles away. Okay, so I also love sushi. Can I eat sushi still? There will be animal-free sushi. In fact, there already is, Lois, so fear not. Amazing. So, okay, what have we left out that the audience ought to know? Uh, the only thing I would suggest, Lois, is that in the past, our relationship with animals has been really one that's based on, on violence, right? So we, we basically take, their, take them, confine them, kill them, and so on. 
But I think in the future that rather than a, a relationship that's based on violence, we're going to have one that's based more on compassion. And that will be enabled by the fact that we won't be so reliant on the use of animals for food anymore. In the same way that we are no longer reliant on horses to transport us around or on whales to make to give us whale oil to white our homes, we will not be reliant on chickens and turkeys and pigs and cows to feed us because we will have invented new technologies that render that practice obsolete. That is a legacy that is worth leaving. Okay, you mentioned turkey. What happens to my Thanksgiving dinner? You're still going to have a lovely time, Lois. Don't worry. And so will the turkeys. <laughs> the turkeys will also have a lovely time. One more question. And you and because you talked about collaboration, I think collaboration is the future of a lot of things, especially when it comes to um, businesses that look at sustainability. And so do you have a good best example of a collaboration that you have been involved in with what you're doing? I think Purdue Farms is probably the best one. So we supply ingredients that are plant-based to Purdue Farms. And this is a chicken company that makes a half chicken nugget, half uh, chick, it's half chicken, half plant-based nugget. And it's very popular. Um, it was in fact named the best tasting frozen chicken nugget in America by the Food Network. So imagine if all of the chicken nuggets could be only 50% chicken and 50% plant-based, you would have much healthier kids because you'd have less saturated fat, less cholesterol, fewer calories, more fiber, and so on. You'd need to use fewer animals, so you would have uh, less land use and less greenhouse gas emissions, and the world would be a better place. And so I'm perfectly proud of what Purdue and the Better Meat Co. have done together. Wonderful. Where do you see collaboration not working in your particular situation? Well, in companies like mine that are startups, when we work with really large companies, I think it's important for the companies to recognize that a lot of what we're doing is R&D, it's research and development. And so it's important that to know like, we are not running um, you know, a well-established business. We're only a few years old. And so there has to be some leeway to uh, create something from nothing and create processes that develop a consistent product for every, every order. You have been absolutely wonderful. I think this is going to ignite a lot of conversations around dinner tables as people <laughs> listen to this and wonder, what am I eating and what's it created from? And um, is it a source that's better for us in our future, for our legacy that we're going to leave? So, Paul, thank you so much for being with us today on Building My Legacy podcast. And for those of you who are listening to Building My Legacy podcast, thank you. Be sure to visit our website as well at www.buildtomorrow.com. We will have information about Paul in the show notes. So please feel free to contact him. We, we encourage you to because I hope that this generates conversations, important conversations in your lives. So thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Really great to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you for watching my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell button above. Leave comments. We'd love to hear what you think. And visit our other social media links as well. Thanks much.